Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. At some point in our lives, all of us have been exposed to the computer in some fashion or another. We know that computers can guide astronauts to the moon and back safely, and we know that computers send our monthly utility bills. And we probably also have or have heard of people who have received someone else's bill or charges for items they never purchased. In plain words, we know that computers have almost an unbelievable capability and capacity and power, and we know that if a mistake is made, computers seem to compound it. Computers can make our lives super efficient, or they can drive us close to desperation. What most of us tend to forget is that while computers can fail mechanically or electronically, they don't make mistakes. The mistakes are caused by the people who program or feed the information into the computer. And people are also responsible for the vast amounts of knowledge that enables computers to operate properly and to do their thing. Many of us are also aware of the growing use of computers in educational institutions. As part of our pilot program in dentistry, the University of Michigan School of Dentistry has undertaken a substantial use of computer-assisted instruction, or CAI, as it is commonly called. What have we done during the project? And what have we learned that might help other schools or institutions? To pursue these questions, we talked with our computer personnel. James Conklin, manager and systems programmer. Michael Deaver, applications programmer. Scott Dixon, systems programmer. And Judson Spencer, applications programmer. Each offered interesting thoughts, suggestions, and experiences. One way to start our investigation is to ask, what makes the computer unique or different than the other media used in dental education? Jim Conklin responds. Big difference between computers and um, other types of media, I think, is that that this the most other types of thing uh, equipment is simply hardware. Okay, in, in our view. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you can plug it together, you can plug different things together, but once you plug it together, you can change the dials and things, but you're stuck with what you've got. Okay, in a computer, you can plug different things together. Okay, but now you also can put a program in and make, and that becomes changing the dials, and you can change the program over and over, and it changes how all of these basic things, uh, in terms of transformation of information, and movement of information occur when, you know, how, and all the various things that a computer can do. And that's, that's the real difference. Before discussing what we have done and what we plan to do, perhaps we should investigate exactly what is involved in a computer system. We asked Jim Conklin to explain in layman's terms. I think look at it in terms of uh, <clears throat> um, like a stereo system, okay? Um, where you have a bunch of components that you put together and make, you know, um, well, you have your speakers and your amplifier and so forth. Okay, well, a computer system is the same kind of thing. You have a bunch of components. You have what they call disk drives and um, magnetic tapes and the central processor, <clears throat> memory, and various other kinds of things, things that will drive terminals. And you put these together. Now, they communicate electronically, but they really don't understand each other. And what happens is there's programs written that uh, is used, these programs are used to make them communicate in such a way that the information is understandable by each of the electrical components, if you like. And 
that particular function is what a systems programmer does. And, well, if we look at it as terms of getting information from one place, putting it into the computer, then we're trying to, the computer performs some sort of transformation on the information and then puts it out again. And it may perform more and more transformations and, uh, and putting it out. And what the application programmer is concerned about is how to get that information into the computer, transform it, and get it back out in usable form to people. We also hear people refer to hardware and software. If I understand it correctly, it boils down to this. Hardware is the equipment or the machinery, the actual computer itself, and the software is the programming or languages that is entered into the computer and transmitted to the end user, the student, that makes the computer usable to people. Since the computer is new to education, one of the first questions I asked was, if I'm a faculty member, what do I need to know before I can start to work with the computer? We don't discourage people from coming down and learning about the computer and what it can do, but the faculty member's place is really not uh, running a computer or programming it. Uh, he should be more interested in what types of sequences he is interested in projecting to the student. Uh, and what type of displays uh, he's interested in, what type of educational sequences he wants to portray to the student himself. It's like if the computer speaks one language and you speak English, you could learn the computer's language if you were interested, or you could come to me and I would be the translator between you and the machine. If a faculty member doesn't have to know anything about computers, then it seemed logical to me that a computer programmer would have to know an awful lot about dentistry. And I was curious, how can you do that if you're not a dentist? Well, just like a translator doesn't have to know what he's translating, I don't really have to know about dentistry. That's kind of simplistic because as the programs become more difficult and more involved, I'll have to develop an, an understanding of what's happening as far as the dentistry goes so that I can make sure the computer is doing what it's supposed to be doing without having to, running, to come running back to you all the time and saying, is this right, is this right? In some cases, we have found that we have had to go in and learn some things about the dental field. We may have to go more than halfway with a dentist to learn uh, the types of things that he wants to portray on the computer. Right, the structure is set up for uh, things in general. And then if you look at information uh, in dentistry that the, you as a dentist uh, furnishes to us. But this information may be English, or it may be history, or it may be mathematics, anything, as far as we're concerned. All right. As a faculty member, I don't have to know anything about the computer. And as a programmer, you really don't have to know anything about dentistry. How long, then? will it take to translate my ideas into a usable program for student use? I would say it depends on the type of program that you're interested in. If it's a, a drill and practice program, it takes us approximately as long as it would take a secretary to type the information in and have the professor uh, proofread the information that we have in the machine. And then it's a matter of know, maybe an hour or so to uh, load all the information in the machine and it's ready to go. If they come down and want some type of simulation, uh, you may be talking about a year's worth of work. Is there some kind of a rule of thumb uh, that you might have for how long it takes to do a program and then how much of a mess I create by asking for little changes as we go along? Not really as a rule of thumb. The, it really depends on how well it was designed to begin with and how well you express the possibility that you might be adding rooms or adding machines. It's easy to do it originally, but in the process of programming, it will make, the programmer will make some assumptions about your particular problem. Well, if you come back and try to violate one of those assumptions, 
then it could that your simple little change could be a real problem. The whole point is to to try to hold the costs of going back and continually rewriting parts of your program uh, because pretty soon you end up having that consume all, all the programmers' time and you're not doing anything new. Like all other aspects of dental education, it pays to be thoroughly prepared before beginning. Since the computer is new to all of us, we all have to begin somewhere. I asked Jim Conklin where and how most people get started. Most people come in, uh, faculty or whoever, when they come in to use a computer, they come in with what they've seen before. I mean, the, I, they saw somebody else give a test mm -hmm. on a computer and, wow, that looked like it saved them a lot of time. So they come in and say, I want to do a test. Okay, they haven't thought about it any farther than that. If testing is the most common starting point, I wondered if it was a good starting point and if it was a good effective use of the computer. Mike Deaver offers these thoughts. It's where most people get started. It's fairly easy to get started that way because we have a, a system where questions can be put into the computer with a, a minimum amount of effort on the author's part. He just has to write the questions. And from that point on, we can develop the program for him in, in about two weeks or less. The problems come is when the faculty member get, might get interested in testing for grading, which seems like a natural progression to go. And the problem comes is when we get into the uh, proctoring problem. Just if someone's interested in grades, the computer has to start keeping that data around. I think I hear you saying that it's going to be just as easy for a student to, uh, shall we say, cheat in front of a computer terminal as it is in a lecture hall where you're taking a two-hour blue book examination. Absolutely. Yes. So we can't be sure who's taking the test or how many times they've taken it. Since testing isn't one of the better uses of the computer, there must be some things we are doing that take better advantage of the computer's capabilities and capacity. What follows is a brief discussion of some programs currently in use by our students. Okay, what the program does is the student keeps track of for the five days what he's eaten and that's typed into the computer. The computer then looks up in a table of foods, all the foods that are listed. Um, all the totals are added up for all the various nutrients and then a report is given and if there is a recommended daily allowance set up by the government, that's marked on the graph as shown, there's a little RDA line. Mm -hmm. and that tells the student if, for this small sample, whether he's meeting the recommended daily allowances for like calories or carbohydrates or uh, vitamins. Patient simulation is one of the better uses of this particular method. Uh, you allow the student to make answers. You allow him to ask for tests run on the particular patient. Uh, and all of these can be given back to the student, the results of tests. Uh, and then if he has answers right or answers wrong, then you know, lead him along a little bit. The program, one program that we've developed is a articulator simulation. And this is where we've taken and modeled a dinar articulator uh, mathematically and then as for the output, we draw outlines of teeth and show how the one set of teeth draw on the other. The computer is adjusted uh, just like the articulator would be in the sense of all the adjustments that are on the dinar and a few extra ones uh, can be adjusted by the student as long as they fit within reality. The uh, program that, that we have um, actually had to be constrained to only make those movements that an articulator uh, does because it, it was actually capable of, of simulating more accurately the movements of the jaw than the, uh, you know, the system they have for doing it now. These examples are currently in use by students. I wondered what else is planned or possible. My question brought this response from Jim Conklin. For example, you could have situations where you would want to simulate a, a person's 
um, reactions to a dentist, okay? Physical reactions, let's say. You could do psychological, but that might be a little trickier since we don't know enough. But like physical reactions. For example, <clears throat> a patient has a heart attack in a chair or certain other kinds of characteristics. And now the dentist has to apply immediate reaction. Uh, uh, he has to do something immediately to save this person. The person who's uh, interested in drawing skulls, one problem that uh, a class has encountered in gross anatomy is the proportions, the right proportions for like the head, the, the jaw, the, uh, the bones that are located in the side of the face and getting the student to understand the right proportions and what is considered normal versus abnormal. So what they'd like to do is have the computer draw up some outlines and the student pick and choose from various parts and construct a skull. And then the computer can eva tell them, no, those parts don't fit together properly, or they do. It seems then that we are beginning to tap the great potential of a computer system. One thing that we haven't discussed is how are these materials received? How do students react? In the patient simulation, uh, they seem to react very well. Some of them do it uh, singly, and in quite a few cases, we've had the students maybe have two or three in the group, and they will select somebody as the chief button pusher for the machine and they'll sit around to discuss the case. And then when they decide this is what the answer should be, then the chief button pusher pushes the button and uh, they see what the answer is. How do the students react to most of the programs we have? And do they, do they voice complaints or do they seem genuinely happy or, or a little bit of both? A little bit of both. Um, Students are very vocal when there's a problem with a computer. It's very confusing to them. They're not used to the computer. Um, if a program has problems, they're very quick to point it out. They'll, we have a, as a aid to the students for a line of communication to the programmers, we've created a gripe file where the student can, while he's working on a program, if he finds out something's misspelled or he disagrees with a question, he can type in his complaint or his suggestion right then and there and it's recorded and then we look at the file every week or so and check to see what's wrong with the various uh, question banks or uh, programs that we have running on the computer. And this way it gives the students a chance to feed back to us what's happening out there which we can't watch all the time. Yeah. If we get a variety of reactions from the students, what kind of a response do we get from the faculty? And is there a resistance to the new technology? These questions elicited these differing responses. On the part of the faculty, not too much. Uh, I think if there's any resistance, it's a matter of they don't want to bother learning about the computer or they just don't have the time. Uh, the students, more or less the same problem, where the students, if they have to learn a lot to run a program, will not like it at all. They don't feel that their time is well spent in learning to communicate with the computer. They want something that's straightforward and simple to use. And if you design a program, that's one of the considerations you have to take into account, is that it has to be very simple to use, because people do not want to learn how to program. You find a complete spectrum of people within the faculty. That uh, There are those that think the computer is the greatest thing in the world and others that just won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. People that really don't understand what the computer can do and what, they, what it can't do. And until they come down and talk with us, they're more or less afraid of it because it's some nebulous machine that, you know, that they're afraid of might take away their job or something. We've done a lot of talking about the computer and how it is used and about how faculty and students react. But we haven't talked about one rather important item, cost. With an expensive machine and four people to operate and program it, I suspected that our cost efficiency per student use isn't as low as we would like it to be. I asked. I don't think that our machine is particularly cost effective uh, doing the, the uh, question answer testing type operations that it's mostly doing right now. 
we do have some some uh, programs that generate graphics and simulate jaw movements and things like that, which uh, could could turn out to be quite cost effective considering the costs of the alternatives, the the articulator and things like that. There's two. There's essentially two ways to cut the cost of, um, of computers and instruction. One is to have it such that the thing is automated and you can do this kind of thing, uh, whatever it is you want to, to do very quickly. Testing is something that we're able to do that with. And we have done that. Okay, so it's fairly inexpensive. The other way to do it is get it to a massive number of students. There are a variety of ways of doing that. One is distributing it to other universities. Another is that it may be applicable in 30 courses. Uh, that's highly unlikely, but it's possible, mm -hmm. in which case you have the same students dealing with a program in 30 different courses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it becomes cost effective that way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it all boils down to either make it very inexpensive, that is, you can put it on the machine very inexpensively, and there are only a very few things you can do that to, or get it to a large number of people and use it for a long time. Mm -hmm. If we are not yet as cost effective as we would like to be or hope to be, what must we do to make the computer a viable medium for dental education? Jim Conklin responds. The only real way to cut it down is, is to distribute it. It seems then that we must investigate sharing our materials with other schools. I asked Scott Dixon if this was possible. Well, there's some, some problems with that. Uh, most of the programs were written in Fortran, which is a relatively widely available computer language, uh, so that you could theoretically, anyway, take mm -hmm. programs that we've developed for our computer and, and transport them to virtually any machine that's, that's made. However, Fortran program has to make calls on, the, on an operating system to, say, uh, read a record from a disk or something like that. And that's something that's handled differently on virtually every computer made, so that all those kinds of things would have to be changed. However, a dental school could go and buy a, a prime computer system and, and just uh, then take our programs, you know, to essentially buy the whole system that we have, take all our programs, put them on there, and they would run immediately. Based on our conversations with these four computer experts, it seems that we are just beginning to tap the enormous potential of computer-assisted instruction. Faculty and computer programmers alike are just becoming aware of the many possibilities that do exist. The capacity is there. It's just a matter of taking advantage of it. If we can take advantage of it, and if we can share the materials with others, the computer may well become an important, viable, and cost-effective medium in dental education. Until then, we must continue to experiment and to develop other pilot programs for use within our curriculum. One area that we haven't covered is how can a faculty member at another dental school get started in the CAI business? I asked Jim Conklin for his ideas. The first thing to do is get a hold of somebody who knows something about computers. Okay. A am I likely to have someone like that on my campus? Absolutely. You will, will, will any campus now uses computers. I don't know of any place, even no place in the country that does not use a computer. I'm sure that there's someone there that knows something about them. You get that person and, and just talk to them. They will, they will start you out in the most appropriate way for that campus and, and lead you through or help you get through the problems that you're going to have to deal with. And there are a lot. Once, if you're setting up from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, one should anticipate, if they're setting up from scratch, one should anticipate two years before you're really going to be running anything reasonable. So there are facilities and personnel at other schools which are available to dental school faculty. And interested faculty need only take the first step. It seemed to me that after four years of experimentation and use of our computer system, our computer people might have a final thought to pass along to newcomers to the CAI field. Scott Dixon did. Don't just delve into, the, into this computer technology game 
just because it is a new technology and everybody's doing it and it's flashy and all that, uh, you should have some definite idea about the kinds of things you want to do before you go jump in because uh, with the costs of, of people and hardware and things, it gets expensive in a hurry. And also, if you don't know what you want to do, you end up uh, just running around in circles trying to, trying to do something and you do it and then you don't like that, so you try and do it over and, and you end up getting nowhere. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.